This is Tommy Chong, man, and this is Wake and Bake with Captain Hooter. It's Captain Hooter. Hello. Dzień dobry. Bon dia. Dobre je utra. Dobre utra. I tu jest Good morning. Good morning. We look up acting. Buenos dias. Hello. Everybody online looking good. Morning. Sawadee krab. Good night. Dobro horanku. Bon di. Como va? Habari a tu buhi. Good morning world. What's happening, everybody? Hooter here, coming to you with a great interview today. Dude, we have a legend, one of the best. Much better than my aim here. Can't believe it's that bad. They're breaking in! God, I can't believe I sucked that bad. Anyway, listen, guys. We have one of the true legends in the industry, none other than Dan Hare. That's right. The son of the legendary Jack Hare. And dude, we have quite a show. You know what we did today? We talked a lot about doing exactly this. Defending your home turf. And that's what this is. This is all about defending your, your ground. Defending your brand. And that's what I'm doing here. I am defending Captain Hooter from the world. From these... These infidels who are trying to steal my brand. Just the same thing that Dan's doing, trying to maintain the hair brand. Well, I'm going to be here picking these guys off. Uh oh. Uh oh. They're sneaking around me. Listen, I'm going to defend the realm here. You guys watch this interview. Awesome interview, and I'll be back right after. Oh shit. Except I got this big guy I'm going to have to pick off here. All right. Come on, big man. Come on, big man. What do you got? What do you got? I'm going to shoot you in the cajoni. Just in the cajonis. I'll teach you. Come on. Uh-oh. I better shoot faster. Uh-oh. Oh, God. How about that? Gucci, 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 gucci. <laughs> All right, enjoy this interview. We'll be back in a few minutes. Hola, hola, everyone. Captain Hooter here, coming to you once again, very high and very alive. And today I come here with royalty. Dude, real royalty. Um, I'm honored to have had an opportunity just in the last couple of weeks to meet this gentleman. Um, and I am uh, thrilled that he had a, a little bit of time to come in and see us this morning for a prop wake and bake. Uh, properly introducing. Dan Herr, how are you, sir? <laughs> I'm doing well this morning. Thanks for the invite. Dude, I was thrilled to get a chance to actually see you, but not just meet you, but actually watch you um, with a bunch of uh, other people in an open market, you know? Um, being there at uh, Canada Portugal was a fascinating experience because I got a chance to see you interacting with and all of the things that I had no idea that you were involved in. Dude. Um, very impressed all the way around. Thrilled to uh, thrilled to to actually see you uh, working in the wild. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we all we all work in the land of smoke and mirrors, so uh, you know, we do, we do our best, and uh, and you know, being out um, and and participating in the, the global space that we're all you know continuing to create is. Uh, is thrilling, frightening, and uh, and it's just a it could be a really magical place to be a part of. Uh, I have a ton of questions now. I'm just going to be honest with you. If anybody really wants to know the history of your dad, I mean, you can go and look this stuff up. It's all here. Um, he's brilliant. Uh, he's the Godfather. He's the Emperor. He is, dude. He's fucking Nostradamus. Is who he was. The, the shit that he predicted that was so dead on is unbelievable. And I think we all, 
a lot of us know that. I've got some kind of different questions for you, if you don't mind, um, no. that, that are just like off the bat. So my first question is, what kind of dad was he? You know, I've been thinking about it, you know, being an MP, former MP, right? You've got to have this real kind of a conflicting kind of a thing, right? How was he though? Was he laid more laid back or was he more uh, the MP strict dad? Well, a little of both, but remember, you know, he, he wasn't, you know, he wasn't anywhere near cannabis until he was 30, right? So, right. so growing up the first few years, it was really very, uh, very tense. Um, I don't remember a ton of really loving, touching moments in, in the first you know, 10 years, it, you know, it really, it took, it took time for him to find who, who he became. Mm -hmm. And, and his military experience and that, that level of dedication to something is what he brought to the, you know, to, to the to the truth of cannabis and to his path that he that he started once he discovered cannabis and found its truth, he used that military incentive to get it done. Yeah. And and really just push forward regardless of whether people thought he was crazy, he was on a mission. And nope. during that time he was able to focus on being an educator, being an activist. Um, this is before we were, we, we, we were act advocates as we are now. We are more advocates than activists. And uh, he was that activist. He was that voice. He was that, you know, that thing, that, that indescribable, unstoppable, you know, force that just willed cannabis to become part of the world fabric of the future. Yeah. You know, now, as I'm watching and as you're kind of looking at, again, kind of some, this, this playlist, this lifeline in front of him, how long was it before, you know, he's first taken his first hits of the killer Acapulco gold to the time when he's having a mushroom experience? <laughs> that I couldn't tell you, you know. Um, but, I was, but he did get into mushrooms at some point, right? Because I mean, oh, he got his, very into he got very into mushrooms. Okay. Um, I, I think that probably started more eighties, nineties, and and definitely into um, the last ten years of his life. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think he had a stroke in two thousand. Um, he started going into lots and lots of medicinal, um, you know, substances and okay. cannabis mushrooms were, were, were two of them. And, uh, he started doing a lot of mushrooms, uh, a couple of years after his stroke. And was there a dramatic difference in his personality and, or, I mean, could you, <laughs> could you, <laughs> okay obviously um, was. you know i i don't know if there was a tremendous difference in his, in his personality i i don't know the level of how much he consumed at the time but um i know from about 2005 to you know up till the time of his death uh in 2010 he you know he was able to communicate much better uh, than he had in the first five years after the stroke. Um, so the whatever he was doing, whether it was just natural, you know, regaining some of his abilities uh, just through time or whether mushrooms were part of that, I couldn't really say. I, w I wasn't with him as often uh, in the last few years of his life as I was in the first you know, 40 of mine or 50 of right. mine. Right. You know, he was living no, somewhere else. Yeah. 
and now that I was going to get to that also. Now there's other there's other uh, sons. There's another son who there's who there's been, five brothers and sisters. Five brothers and sisters. And is everybody in the business or in the industry in one way or another? Um, no. Um, my my brothers uh, all have their own uh, careers and and paths. My sisters. Uh, My sister one is a, a was a nurse. Uh, now she's expanding her uh, her experience in the medical field. My youngest sister was a teacher. Now she is uh, doing some work in dispensaries. But as far as as far as you know, the things that I'm doing, um, none of them really want to do what I'm doing because. Uh, no. This this space uh, is hard and it's vicious and so many things that have happened since my dad's passing is truly uh, unnerving uh, with regards to um, the the stresses that are part of um, working and building and um, continuing to expand the check our name and presence and understanding from every level, whether it's education, um, whether it's industrial application, or whether it's part of this, this, you know, uh, expanding opportunity from uh, a consumer, you know, goods product from, you know, just being in cannabis. And uh, it's, it's treacherous. And this, the things that uh, that one has to go through to be a part of this uh, is is difficult. So uh, they've chosen to to stay away from. They're interested in it, but it's not, you know, uh, you know, it's it's not their first idea of what they want to do uh, as an adult. And we're all, you know, in our in our 40s and 50s and 60s these days. So it's not that, you know, you don't have a whole lifetime to develop a new career. You know, you're in your career. And hopefully the things that I'm doing will benefit uh, all of my family's lives and and touch them and give them the abilities to do things uh, that they, you know, that they want to do that they may not have been able to do. Um, but I got to get through this journey first. Yeah. You know, it's funny because uh, it, it's not funny, but I, I, while I was even sitting there in Portugal, you had a, a, a lady come up to you with a, a, a bootleg book. I mean, right to your <laughs> face, which was, you know, that I didn't, that didn't ever really hit me about, you know, the amount of brand theft, you know, and these types of things. And I'm thinking, and, and what was it? Wasn't it a third? Third edition, a third yeah. edition of. Wow. It was it was the third edition of a book, of my dad's book in a different language, that I never knew about. That you know, and it had been, you know, published for twenty years, and <laughs> and I had just seen it for the first time, and they're like, oh, could you sign this? And there's a part of me that's screaming inside, that, you know. How is this even possible? And on the other side, I look at it from her experience. Mm-hmm. She has nothing to do with what created the information she was holding in her hand. And for her, the connection to that was real. You yeah. know, and the information that's in that book is, is also real. So there was a double edged sword moment for me where it was incredibly painful. But on the other hand, this was a woman um, that was taking in this information and it was important to her. And if it's important to her, that means it's going to be important to the people around her and to her future and to the understanding of those that deal with her. And who knows how that book is going to affect her and, and the future of the lives of people that she touches. So from that standpoint, it's incredibly positive, but from uh, the other side of this, it's yeah. it's hard. It's hard to believe that somebody would just take something 
and call it mine. You know, like, yeah, we're going to take the Jack Hare name. That belongs to me, you know, <laughs> or, or in this case, an entire body of work and just publish it and say nothing to the estate or to my father during his life uh, or to us, you know, the ones that are managing uh, my my father's, uh, you know, the things that my father created energy wise in his life. And, um, you know, to not reach out, to not, to not acknowledge and become part of this family by working with my father's name. Um, that was incredibly insulting. Uh, yeah. but on the flip side, meeting the person who was inspired by that book was incredibly uplifting. Yeah. You know, it's funny because I was at Spanibus and, uh, uh, handed a pack of, uh, raw papers to Josh Kesselman and, uh, First thing he did is opened up the papers and held up the paper to the light. And he goes, these are bootleg papers, you know, and, and, and <laughs> it was, you know, I, so I, in a weird way, I was kind of in that same thing. I'm handing him bootleg papers of his own, of his own work. And uh, at least at that day, we were able to learn, you know, how to tell the difference between real raw and fake raws that day. But uh, I can't even imagine if, if you're having these types of these types of examples uh, constantly being thrown at you. And then once I saw the book happen, then I started thinking about all the other things and thinking about all the the, the cultivars. And the, we had a chance to talk about this while we were there. Now we're talking about something that's positive and something that's good. Okay, so this is that all natural Jack and. Uh, I don't know if you've been watching my previous episodes, but I have mentioned this over and over and over again in previous episodes because I've been using it as almost an introduction when I go to all of these cannabis events and, you know, have you ever smelled the real deal? And, you know, when I was able to sit there with you and actually talk about this, one of the conversations we started having was about all of the potential for all of the branding of just the smell, right? Yeah. Just this fragrance by itself. Um, my wife is in love with this as a cologne. She wants me to just take it. And, and I think that's what we did. Well, <laughs> well we I, 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 I actually do that here. Um, long before uh, long before I met you there, um, since Abstracts has been making our, you know, uh, authentic Jack terpene, uh, I've been using it and dabbing it here and there. Um, and uh, it's it's just uh, an amazing scent. You know, it's it's so different. It's it's different, but it's not from other cannabis. Like you still, you, you know, if you're in the cannabis, you know that there's the smell, but it, it's, it's very unique in its terpene oh, profile. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it's something that can be uh, and, and it tastes great, by the way, in edibles. It is, um, it is truly, uh, it, it's enjoyable. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, it is one of the, my all-time favorite, you know, um, fragrances. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, 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 I try and, I'm an interpreter, so I'm supposed to get into the details. And if I'm getting into interpreting, you know, I'm, I'm talking about the sour citrus flavor and I'm talking about mercine and, you know, the mangoes and the citrus fruits and the terpenoline and getting all the herbs and the pine and the nutmeg. But, you know, it's the mercine terpenoline tango for me. And I spot that smell. It's like I can name that tune in one note. And it's, uh, <laughs> you know, it drives everything else. You know, I was going to ask you because, you know, the original uh, cultivar, the strain, uh, was done by uh, Sensi Seeds, right, in Amsterdam? Is that correct? Yes. Uh, they, they named it, yes. They named the original. Now, through those years, and, and we all know how cultivars evolve and everything else, you've probably seen a zillion different variations. Have you seen what, what's the one? Like, if somebody came to you and said, what's the one that you would hand and say this is the representation or this is what i feel is the best representation of this right now well if you I, can answer I, that i don't know hand, it might be hands down it's it's the genetic that we use for our brand you know <clears throat> has there been one artist that has painted that genetic the best 
that a better way of putting it? <laughs> well, since we we don't sell our genetics. We don't we don't we don't sell it in clones, we don't sell seeds of it, we only produce it for this brand. Okay. And so the producers that that use the genetic is, you know, they 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 grow beautifully. And and it does <coughs> excuse me. It does change from from climate to climate, you know, mostly uh, in coloring, not not in everything else is still there. It's all still the same, but yeah. um, you know, the the genetic just is yeah. just a beautiful, just a beautiful thing. Absolutely, you know, I know that there's got to be you, out of all the people that come up to you. You must have a zillion people who come up to you and the first thing they say is, dude, I used to party with your dad. And they've <laughs> all got a story, right? And there's yeah. got to be, and, and over the years, the story evolves. It turns into something bigger. Tomorrow, I'm interviewing Tommy Chong. And, oh. you know, one of the, okay, so, you, you know, you're, you're talking about what's the biggest joint, the best joint? How many of the big bamboo joints have you, did you, have you somebody brought you, you know? I'm curious, what you've heard some of these stories. Have, what was the story that blew you away? Have you heard anything that was just, you know, oh my God? You, you know, I, 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 I don't know that I have an oh my God story as much as um, I, I have uh, a, an experience um, with receiving these stories. And the, the oh my God part of it is the fact that 12 years after my father's passed, I still feel him everywhere. Um, when I came out to Portugal and met you and sat down with Mila, those were oh my God moments that I got to share uh, time with folks that my father knew that I didn't. Yeah. And I got to see and feel how much love they had and respect they had for him and you've had for him. And those are the oh my God moments when the hair on my arm stands up and I feel my dad standing next to me. Mm. Mm. Unbelievable. Uh, you know, I knew about him as being a freedom fighter. And yeah. I knew that he, you know, I, I, there's a lot of things I didn't know. Like I didn't know he ran for president twice. <laughs> okay, so yeah, once that, was, that was interesting. Okay, what, twice? What, what, yeah. What made him go twice? There had to have been something, uh, a drive, <laughs> something else. Well, one of, one of the things is like, you know, you go into something like that knowing that you're not going to become the president of the United States um, as somebody like Jack Kerr. But okay. what it does give you is exposure to, to, to educate people. And it gives you a platform to do it, even if the news is, is making fun of you because, you know, oh, he's wearing hemp clothing. Can you smoke it? And, and, they, and they go right to, you know, the, the, the typical vision yeah. or thought of who somebody who smokes cannabis was back in the 70s or 80s or 90s. They would make fun of it's like, oh, you know, they're just a pothead. And what they didn't, what they didn't want to understand is how important this plant was. And so it was his job to take those opportunities to educate people uh, at a level and touch people in, in, in ways that he couldn't do it just by being the activist, activist on the street um, or, you know, getting his book into somebody's hand. It was a way for him to have a, a, a megaphone platform for a short period of time that gave him the ability to uh, expose people who wouldn't generally be exposed to the understanding that cannabis is this incredibly powerful plant that changes and touches everybody's life, whether they believe it in or not. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's one of the other things that uh, kind of surprised me other than the, you know, the fact that he ran for president twice was that he had created this judging system 
that <laughs> I didn't until recently realize that that was my dad's judging system. Okay. <laughs> when I grew up, and I don't know if I told you, but my, you know, my dad was a coke dealer and he was involved in the cannabis industry and everything else, but that was, he was primarily a coke dealer. And, but when he talked about weed and when he talked about quality of weed, I didn't realize until recently that, you know, when he was talking about it being very high or very stoned or stone stoned, which was the terminology he used, he was using <laughs> that rating guide. How come, I mean, what happened with all of that? Didn't it? I mean, that was quite a big story. Yeah, well, so that that came about about three years after my dad first um discovered cannabis for himself and uh, as he was educating himself he wanted to you know write it down and so he can you know that's just the way he was he was always a collector of information and so he decided that if people were going to consume cannabis and this is long before the emperor wears no clothes um this was just understanding this plant that had been demonized and if you were going to go out to the park or to wherever to, to buy it or consume it, um, that you should know what you're getting or know what to look for or be able to describe what it is that you got once you had it and experienced it. So he wrote a book called Grass, the Great Revolutionary American Standard System, which was uh, this, you know, in 1973, it was this furry fruit brothers like cartoon drawn um, you know, story of how to understand your cannabis, you know, where the high took you and how to grade it and what you could expect to pay for something of, of such stature, whether it was this, this little, uh, this, you know, this little blip of a high, whether it was nothing, whether it just completely bummed you out or took you to another place and the variations in between. And, um, you know, when I was when I was 10 and 11, um, the book was published, and I didn't really know anything of cannabis at that time. I didn't even know my dad really, you know, consumed. I didn't I didn't know anything. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I didn't know what was happening on in the adult background behind me or in front of me. Mm -hmm. But I knew this book, and when you open it up, it had all these great drawings in it. And as a as a youngster, it, it was my coloring book. That's that's what my brothers and I use, and and you know we we would get uh, colored markers instead of crayons, and we would we would color in the images, and at the same time we started reading it, and you know like oh what's all these words on here, and that's how we started understanding what my dad was into. Wow, <laughs> how cool is that? That's like what, what a great introduction, and you get a little education while. Love that. Well, education for books, that's the reason why things are getting banned these days in the United States, because you should never learn the truth about anything in a book. You should only learn it by the people and the politicians that tell you what to believe. You mentioned the fabulous furry. Um, you know, for a long time, I didn't, I didn't have the time frame correctly, but I always thought that Freewheeling Franklin was your dad. Um, and I know that the timing doesn't work. I know that doesn't work, but, but uh, you know, cause he was the one that always had the ideas and he was always the one that was leading the, the, the march of, or leading the uh, adventure. Uh, he was, did he connect with the, I, cause I saw, there's a great picture of him uh, uh, holding up one of the, uh, uh, one of the characters. Did he get to know the, the guy who created the, the Freak Brothers? And uh, You know, I, I, I don't know that he ever met him. Uh, I, I know that there was a there's an image of him speaking, and I think there was a poster in front of him on a like a you know a, a, a podium or something. Yeah. It was it was it was mounted to something as he was standing uh, above and behind it, and mm -hmm. it looks it looks intentional, but I don't know that it was. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So I, I I don't know much about that as far as whether they ever met, but. My guess is, um, for as adventurous as he was in the 70s, uh, he came in contact with so many people 
um, that were, you know, part of American, uh, you know, pop culture. Do you think that he had a real clear image of how big he would become or where this no. would all end up? No, I, I, I think, you know, in the latter years, I think that he knew that he had made, um, he had made real inroads um, into educating folks. And that in itself um, led to a sense of that people knew who he was and that the power of his voice and the inspiration that people took from that um, was something um, unique and, and different than, than most folks um, mm -hmm. when it comes to, um, you, you know, when you tell people that cannabis is going to save the world or could save the world, and then you give them an instruction book like The Emperor Wears No Clothes, um, and people read it, and, and they also see the future, uh, the potential future, if we embrace this plant to its full utility, that um, there, there's power in that when, when you can re-educate somebody to the point where they absolutely believe and understand that there's a future that has not yet become and that they want to be a part of it. Yeah, And, and he was, I, I think and he that was, he recognized it. And he was dead on with the, his terminology and the way that he expressed it. Uh, the first thing that I learned from him was one acre of hemp equals four acres of trees. Simple, right? Just boom. Yeah. You throw it into a block and how, you, you'll never forget that. It's one of those, you know, uh, unbelievable the amount of miles and time that that man spent uh, on the road. And going through all these events, I've interviewed two other freedom fighters, uh, Adam Brook and uh, Captain Joint. And both of them had different stories. Uh, Brett Bogue has a, everybody's got a, a story, right? About your dad. Yeah. And there, you never hear one story about him being a slacker. You never hear one story about him not making it or not being able to get things done. That man took his military experience expertise mindset and threw it into this cause and he is forever going to be this this absolute you know i'm going to go obi-wan i like the obi-wan kenobi kind of thing because he <laughs> you know he 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 had the power he had the power i could see him doing the, the <laughs> yeah where do you think everything he was, is going he was the pie piper of cannabis in many ways you There's know another one uh, <laughs> And, and he literally, um, as he would go on his journeys, as he would go on dead tours, as he would uh, go on rainbow tours and go to, you know, whatever, whatever the event was or the, or, or the function, whether it was on the West Coast or the East Coast, as, as he would go and travel, people would naturally gather around. Uh, and some, some would come and take information and leave. And, and others would uh, come be inspired and stay. And they would become part of, uh, you know, his traveling tour group uh, that would uh, help him at events, you know, get the message out, educate people, bring them over uh, and introduce them to my father. My father would introduce them to the book. The book would change uh, their attitude or their mind or perspective. And then it, that book would become a, a part of that person's life. And then as it became a part of that person's life, uh, you know, uh, somebody else would want to read it because it was like, hey, you really have to read this book. And then that book would be handed off to somebody else and then it would inspire them. And this, this you know, it's like, I, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell two friends and they're going to tell two friends and mm -hmm. so on and so on and so on. And that's mm -hmm. really... Um, how his how his fame became is because the the energy and the love that he had for the community of cannabis and those who loved cannabis and this information that had been taken from us and then as you know uh, him and the, his his friends put this collection of information together in this book um, these people became you know and not followers like as in a cult like followers but mm -hmm. followers of, of where he would be speaking and 
what he was doing and how they could help when they could. And that started, Mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, activism in all of the first states that, that started becoming medically accessible after the success of Proposition 215 when he was working with Dennis Perone, who wrote Prop 215, uh, the first cannabis uh, access, uh, you know, law or, you know, initiative uh, since 1937 uh, that mm-hmm. challenged the status quo. And it was his book and the, and the, the, the inspiration that those that the, that the book, you know, uh, lifted up and gave voice to them, you know, like people would read this book and find their voice. And then, you know, state by state by state started following, you know, falling uh, after California. And my father was right there in every one of these states when there was an initiative, when there were people who were, you know, looking for information and looking for more informa- uh, more inspiration. Mm-hmm. My father would go and speak. Mm-hmm. Dude was absolutely the most unselfish. I mean, he went everywhere and he he spent the time and put hours in. I was looking at all the different campaigns that he was involved in um, in California, even before that. I mean, the man the man was a serious machine. Uh, what he do was. you think he would be doing if he if he were alive right now? What would he be doing? Would he be still on the same Yes. Yeah, but now he would have the, yeah. No, he would, he would be one um, really humbled by so many people who have taken their energies and created the life within the cannabis space um, that really have dedicated to um, creating commerce and, and, and new technologies and new applications and new businesses and and really create an industry from when there was none. Um, on the flip side, he would be absolutely beyond pissed off at the way that the government uh, and um, you know some people uh, that are coming into this space are treating the space of cannabis um, with um, no reverence to what how important it really is that they're only there for the financial opportunity and nothing more, um, that they're not really dealing with those who had given their lives uh, and sacrificed themselves, uh, who have been incarcerated, lost their jobs, their families um, through um, you know, uh, asset forfeiture, through wrongful incarceration. When I say wrongful incarceration, if you're you know, this is this has always been an unjust law. So anybody who is still incarcerated uh, for this plant um, is is a problem and was a problem for my father during his life and still would be today. That there would be anybody in jail for this plant or for a plant, and um, so his voice would not be silent. He would not be just sitting back, going, "Look what I've done," uh, or "Look what we've done." He would be like, we. This is what we need to do. This is what still needs to happen, and that fight is every single day within the space. And if you're part of, if you're part of cannabis, you can love it. You can want to be. You can want to be. Uh, you know, a part of it from anywhere from, you know, the pick and shovel side of things, um, where you're selling products into the market that is connected to cannabis, or whether it's you know directly connected to the plant itself. Um, Man, there's 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 yeah. just so much that that could he be running be if he were alive he could be running for president right now <laughs> if he were alive he, he might but you know Whoa. he, he <laughs> but I I think that more more than that I think that the platforms that exist today to expand um, access to information I think he would be all over them. And I think he would be uh, as powerful today as he was 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Yeah. What's next for the brand? What are you gonna? What are you gonna? What are you gonna do? What are we gonna see? Build Any relationships. New products? Yeah. Build relationships. Uh, build opportunities. Um, license um, our our brand, our technology. Um, 
uh, you know, license our RP. And that includes everything from uh, the, you know, my, you know, continuously producing my father's book, the products like that are in your hands and, yeah. and let people know that, um, you know, there, there's lots of Jack adjacent things out there, but there's only one Jack error. And if you want to, if you want to be a part of it, then to this family, you come and mm-hmm. become part of, become part of us, become part of the legacy of Jack Herrer by, by actually working with and building a relationship with the, the, the family of Jack Herrer. And that is us and this brand. And, and what's the best way for them to do that as far as connecting? Is it uh, through the group, through the foundation, through all of the socials? Well, the foundation is an educational foundation. Um, you know, like when, you know, coming to Portugal, it was, it was really to, um, you know, expand education and, and to be a part of uh, elevating pe- people's consciousness. Um, but from a business standpoint, um, you can always DM, uh, you know, direct message on Instagram. Uh, they can go to Jack Her Brands on Instagram and, you know, DM a message if they want to contact the brand. And, um, you know, we're always looking um, not only for stories uh, of my father's, you know, uh, interaction with folks, but, you know, there's always opportunities to uh, potentially expand the relationship of the Jack Harrow family. Um, and we'll just figure out how to, how to get that done. Dude, I, you know, there's, I don't know any other person uh, in this industry that is as loved as, as Pops. I don't know anybody in the industry that has spoken with, with as much um, respect as your dad. And I don't think that um, there will ever be anybody that called it as straight and as dead on as your dad did. And um, I have so much respect for you for what you're doing. Um, you're gonna see on this show, I do, I, what I do is I play a game uh, on my <laughs> Oculus Rift usually to start, the, ga- to start the, the thing, a game that represents what the, the interview is about. The game that I'm gonna be playing uh, that's going to represent you is a game that's called Elven Assassin. And what this guy does, what you do is you stand on a gate with a bow and arrow <coughs> and you're picking off all of the people coming to try to steal things from the castle behind you. Yeah. Right? And, and that's a lot of what you're, you're, you've got yourself into now in, in defending, you're defending your brand just like they're defending their, their castle. Uh, and uh, I, yeah, I've seen I, it. I can tell you that the, the castle has, uh, has a lot of holes in the wall. Uh, <clears throat> and there are many, many, many people um, who feel that they have the right to, to breach the sanctity uh, and take the hero name. And it is definitely a, a process uh, in order to deal with it. And we, we, we try to deal with it because, you know, there's some people who just may not know or understand that, uh, that this is actually a family and that it represents a, a, a real person's life and energy. Um, <clears throat> and we would like the opportunity to educate them and 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 help them become part of the actual community that my father helped to build along with so many other folks that have been a part of um, bringing the truth to bear and changing the narrative in the space that we're all operating in and then there are other ones that know they know who my father was and they know the importance of his name and they take it for financial gain um, with no concern um, of the effect that it has on his family. 
or his legacy. And uh, they create products, um, good or bad, uh, without any thought to, you know, what it is or what it stands for, or the meaning behind uh, what what this brand is and, and who we are and, and what part of the community we represent, which is this community, not a part of this community. Um, so whether it's industrial hemp, whether it's clothing, whether uh, it's, you know, medicinal value, whether it's economic freedom for embracing the opportunities that the plant brings. but acknowledging that this family is that name and that it you know my father's name belongs to us and we're willing to share within that um and we can share within that through licensing through relationship building um and that you know we don't we don't look at everything as we have to litigate our way forward but un unfortunately some of those things do happen and um it's a it's a long painful road um and uh it's the reason why most of my family stays away from what it is that i'm enduring uh, yeah. because uh I, I i internalize all of that uh i internalize all that pain um well, i and, have a and, great suggestion <laughs> i know how to fix it <laughs> Well, look special. That to you. <laughs> I, highly, I highly recommend it. My friend, thank you so much for everything and for your continued battles. And um, uh, just know that there's millions of us out here that are all part of your family. And we're, yeah. we're, we're at your call, ready to go when called upon. Well, you know, uh, I, all I ask is the people that are out there is... Uh, you know, do the right thing in, in your lives, building your companies, uh, experimenting with this plant, being part of the community. Um, know that it's a community, that it is not a commodity, though it can be commoditized. But the, the cannabis community is a, is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And we can, we can live and operate and, and, and work with one another without having to take from one another. And mm. Um, we we want to be a part of the future of cannabis forever. And this family, my father's name, the energy that still comes back to me, comes back to all of us through the opportunities that we've all fought for. And, you know, we want to be a part of the future. And if that is part of your future by becoming, um, you know, connected through this brand, we as a family are open. You know, um, nothing is built uh, by itself. Uh, nobody succeeds on their own. Uh, it takes uh, it, it, it takes a, a village. In this in this case, it takes a community. So, you know, let's all rise up together and and continue to build something that is better than what regular industries are. But you know, because this this represents you know the 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 human you know the human soul. Uh, cannabis has a soul. The plant is intuitive, uh, and the space that we occupy and share with it is important. And um, the future will be much brighter, uh, like that glow above your head right now, uh, as as we all work together. And that's it, dude. Much respect. Blessings to you and your family. And uh, I can't wait to see you at whatever next event. And uh, <laughs> Uh, thank you for everything. No, it's my pleasure. And uh, thanks for having me on your show. It was a great pleasure to meet you in Portugal. And uh, I, I look forward to, to more interactions uh, wherever that may be. Absolutely. Can't wait. Thank you, my friend. We'll see you soon. Be, be well, brother. What's happening, everybody? Welcome back. I'm still defending our realm. I'm not doing a very good job, though. Shit. Where'd he go? Oh, there he is. Oof. I barely got that. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the interview with Dan. He's really an impressive guy. Can you imagine all the pressure that he has on him with his dad's brand? Wow. I am so impressed with everything that he's been doing. 
and I can't wait to talk to him again. I got it, dude. Uh oh. Duck! Uh oh. They're getting by me. Ooh, I got that one back. Okay. Anyway, this is what it's like defending a brand. Just like this. I hope you enjoyed the interview, and I will see you guys on Saturday with none other than Tommy freaking Chong. Tommy Chong, dude. We're cheeching. We're chonging. We're doing it all. In the head. Look out. Oh. Oh. Uh-oh. I'm in trouble. They're getting by me. Oh. Okay. All right. So we'll see you guys on Saturday. Defend the realm. That's all I can tell you. Defend it with everything you've got. Because you don't know when these guys are going to come and get you. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Oh, picked off the dragon? Dude, you can also just become a good shot. If you can become a good shot, that'll help also. Uh -oh. They're breaking uh -oh. in! And that's it for me. All right, guys. I'll see you. Uh, I'll see you on Saturday. <laughs>